Yeah, we better get started actually because um, it's sort of. Um, okay. How long there. do they get for each? So we get three minutes and, and two minutes of questions. Okay. And they said, please try and keep the time. Okay. So How long do you want to get going? I think. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> They're all filling these in as well, are they? We'll be filling these in. Just you and I. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. We're starting a little bit late, so we. Need to move, move ahead. So this is the poster session on surgical andrology and infertility. And, and the first poster is by uh, Mr. Buji at University College uh, London, talking about augmented non-transecting urethroplasty for vulvar urethral strictures. Mr. Buji, in fact. I see, I see you've adopted the Turner Warwick thing of giving everything an acronym. And you've got, oh my God, for oral mucosal graft. Afternoon, my name's Stacey Frost, and I represent the Institute of Urology at UCLH. At our centre, we have moved towards a... Oh, hang on. We have moved towards a non-transecting technique for non-traumatic or idiopathic bulbar strictures. For short strictures with minimal superficial fungi fibrosis, we can perform a stricturoplasty or a non-transecting anastomotic repair. With long strictures, we would augment the entire length of the stricture with oral graft. However, there are a handful of patients who went with a long stricture, but with a short, tight, or even obliterative segment. And in these cases, we can perform an anastomotic repair of the tight segment, then augment uh, the remaining stricture with a graft. In this way, we can use a narrower graft as it avoids circumferential augmentation. Between July 2012 and December 2014, we performed 26 augmented non-transecting anastomotic bulbar urethroplasties for idiopathic strictures. As you can see from these photos, the superficial spongy fibrosis in the tightest segment is incised, then excised in a non-transecting fashion. This leaves underlying healthy vascularized spongiosum. The mucosal edges are then anastomosed and the less severe stricture urethra is augmented dorsally with buccal graft. Our mean follow-up is 19 months. Patients are followed up at four months, one year and five years with a urethrogram and flow rate and they also complete PROMS questionnaires at these time periods. The mean overall stricture length was 5.3 centimetres, with the obliterative segment being on average 1.2 centimetres. We predominantly use buccal graft, uh, though we will use sublingual graft if we think we, can, we need a, a couple of extra centimetres and don't want to take uh, bilateral buccal. Uh, we have had no recurrent uh, strictures seen on urethrogram, and our average uh, flow rate post-op is 26 mils per second. 95% of our patients are either satisfied or very satisfied on the PROMS questionnaire. Seven patients had a post mitrician dribble, though none of them were bothered by this. We have had one patient with erectile dysfunction who needed treatment after six months. Okay. Yeah. In conclusion, augmented non-transecting anastomotic bulbar urethroplasty is associated with excellent outcomes, both in stricture non-recurrence and patient satisfaction. The advantage of this technique is that it allows excision of the narrowest segment of the long bulbar stricture, thus reconstituting the urethral plate to a wider caliber. This means we can use narrower graphs and potentially uh, reduce donor site morbidity 
without compromising long-term success. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Tony, why are you using uh, these acronyms all the time? I thought you'd try to get rid of it from your predecessor. I just like, oh my God, for oral mu mucosal grafts. So, so you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. Chris. Is Antibu up there? Yeah. Need new specs. What? You need new specs. Fourth line down. Any serious questions from the audience or myself? <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, presentation is actually going to be not quite in the order of um, running. We're going to have presentations 11 and 12 by Miss Mahison. The first one being on uh, surgical management of fungating inguinal masses in penile cancer with myocutaneous flat reconstruction. So over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for letting me speak today. My name's Thelma Mahison. I'm a core surgical trainee. Um, so we looked at surgical management of fungating inguinal masses in penile cancer with myocutaneous flap reconstruction. Disease progression and fungating nodes in penile cancer pose a significant challenge to both urologists and patients. Palliative surgical resection with pedicled myocutaneous flaps is one treatment option. We have evaluated our experience at our tertiary centre over a 12-year period. Our aims were twofold to establish the morbidity and mortality outcomes in patients undergoing flap reconstructions, and to establish whether surgery substantially impacted on a patient's quality of life when compared to surgery without flap reconstruction. Over a 12-year period, we identified 19 patients who'd undergone surgical excision with flap reconstruction. All operations were undertaken by the same lead plastic surgeon. In total, one reconstructive procedures were performed in 19 patients. Median length of stay was 18 days. Median length of survival in those who subsequently have died was 186 days. Six patients are still alive with a median follow-up of 866 days. A median percentage of time spent in hospital was 21.5%. Biochemical markers such as neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and CRP are acknowledged to be indicators of prognosis in those with terminal cancer, including colorectal, lung, and soft tissue sarcoma. We wanted to establish if it could be similarly used to predict which patients would do well with flaps. Median neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio was 7.12, median CRP was 19.5, and there was no significant correlation between either of those and length of survival. Of the six living patients, four completed lymphedema quality of life scores. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, it consists of four domains, but for the purpose of this, we looked only at the final domain, which was how do you rate your quality of life at present, with 10 being excellent and zero being poor. We compared this to other studies which looked at quality of life in patients who had not undergone flap reconstructions but had had inguinal surgery and found there was no significant difference. So to conclude, Surgical excision and myocutaneous flap reconstruction is associated with significant complication rates and length of hospital stay. However, 84% of our cohort live for more than three months without a discharging and painful fungating lesion, and 32% are alive with a mean follow-up of 28 months. Patients who underwent flap reconstruction do report similar quality of life, out life outcomes to patients who have groin and or pelvic node surgery without flaps. Thank you. Uh, perfectly in time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions from the audience about that? Mr. Manas? Uh, two questions. One is um, the type of flap you were doing. These are presumably what, rectus abdominis flaps, are they? Or... Uh, TFL. TFL, okay. The second question relates to your last um, statement, three, about I couldn't see any comparative data of patients who've had pelvic nodal dissection or inguinal nodal dissection so in terms of quality of life outcome. 
So can you just elaborate? Yeah, on that? So, so that was actually a separate abstract that was also submitted to BAUS, done by another colleague. It wasn't actually accepted, but we have used her data as the comparison. Okay. And then finally, the third thing is that survival clearly is important, yeah, in terms of choosing the right patient. Mm -hmm. So what would your indications be for surgical intervention? So what type of patient would be suitable for this procedure? And as I quote, Tony Mundy once said to me when we were presenting our data from 2009, which is probably where, uh, what was the point in doing this surgery? So what do you, do you think there is a point? And secondly, what type of patient would be suitable for this? I think that's a very legitimate question, and I know it's very controversial. I think the honest answer is it's about quality of life, isn't it? It's about looking at patients who... So I think patients who have had, do have a big quality of life impact with the fungating mass, so patients who are struggling with it, patients who are finding it very difficult to you know, <coughs> stop hospital admission, so to people who are bouncing in and out, these are the patients we're offering it to. We are carefully counselling them, you know, this is high risk surgery in terms of complication rate and length of stay, but I think it is about looking at whether or not you can really improve their quality of life, and that's how we're making these decisions. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So that's once again perfectly within time. We'll move on to your next uh, presentation on dynamic sentinel node biopsy of inguinal nodes in squamous carcinoma of the male urethra. Squamous cell carcinoma of the male urethra accounts for less than 1% of urological malignancy. Nodal disease poses, poses a significant challenge and has implications on management and prognosis. At our center, our specialist MDT agreed to ma manage SS SCC of the male urethra as for penile cancer, with the decision of primary lesion and dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy. For the purpose of dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy, the assumption was made that urethral cancer, like penile cancer, first metastasizes to inguinal nodes. So we had two key objectives, to confirm that the lymphatic drainage of SCC of the male urethra does indeed metastasize to the inguinal nodes first, and secondly, to establish whether the dynamic sentinel node biopsy technique can be applied to distal urethral cancer. We reviewed our prospectively collected database of all patients with confirmed SCC of the urethra. All patients who had clinically inguinal negative nodes were offered dynamic sentinel node biopsy as part of the staging. We collected data on patient demographics, subtype of tumor, and complications. In total, we identified 80 patients with confirmed SCC urethral cancer. Of these, 46 had clinically negative inguinal nodes and sub subsequently underwent dynamic sentinel node biopsy. 37 patients had bilateral procedures. 15 patients had positive nodes, three of which put positive bilaterally, and all patients with positive nodes underwent completion inguinal lymph node clearance. Sorry. As part of their follow-up, patients with negative dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy were offered regular clinical examination under our surveillance program. In the median follow-up of 34 months, no patient went on to develop clinically palpable lymph nodes. So here we look at the grade and stage of the tumor in accordance with the TNM7 urethral system. All pathology specimens were validated by a specialist pathologist. As anticipated, Basaloid subtype was the most common, followed by usual subtype. Other subtypes include mucoepidermoid, verrucous, and sarcomatoid. Of the patients with positive nodes, 11 had tumors of the usual subtype. There were five complications as a consequence of the dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy. Two were clavian one, and three were clavian two. So to conclude, in this series, we have shown that SCC of the male urethra like penile cancer, does first metastasize to the inguinal nodes. We've also confirmed that in our series, staging with dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy can be used to identify patients at risk of micrometastatic disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor about that? Quick question for you. So DSMB obviously very well established for penile cancer. Um, what made you embark on this with urethral uh, cancer? And do you think that this is going to become 
the gold standard like it has for penile cancer. So I think part of the reason that we embarked on this was to do with the morbidity associated with complete inguinal clearance. So we know that those patients are more likely to go on to develop lymphedema. So this was an alternative option to explore whether or not we could reduce that morbidity by introducing dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy. And the honest answer is I don't know if we, we will see that sort of disseminated across the andrology. But will will like you to continue so. to do this now? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So, so we're going to go back to the original order now. So we're going to do full-length urethral stricture disease, secretary's lichen sclerosis, long-term outcomes from <coughs> urethroplasty from um, Sheffield. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Boxall. I'm a core trainee based in Sheffield in South Yorkshire. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, full-length strictures secondary to lichen sclerosis. Lichen sclerosis is a uh, chronic inflammatory condition which can affect the entire anterior male urethra uh, and can cause significant uh, impact on quality of the patient's quality of life and often presents as bladder uh, outlet obstruction in terms of the symptoms. The full-length strictures are complex to manage and there are several different ways which they can be approached uh, surgically either with uh, optical urethrotomy uh, and uh, subsequent urethral dilatation, uh, with urethrostomy or urethroplasty. The long-term outcomes for urethroplasty secondary to this pathology are not well known, which is why, um, and so we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to evaluate what the long-term outcomes of this were. So we looked at all cases of lichen sclerosis uh, who underwent urethroplasty prior to 2008 to ensure a minimum of six years follow-up. These patients uh, underwent uh, two stages. They, uh, well, they underwent a two-stage process for the penile urethra uh, and a single-stage uh, dorsal onlay technique for the bulbar urethra. The, the follow-up was uh, annually after the, initial, well, after the final procedure where they underwent uh, urethroscopy and careful clinical assessment. 25 cases were identified, uh, however, three were lost to long-term follow-up, one of, one of whom died of an unrelated condition. The mean follow-up was 110 months. Uh, at long-term follow-up, we have 60% uh, voiding freely and 22% uh, are performing, uh, have had urethrotomy and are performing intermittent self-dilatation. However, 18% uh, had to undergo major revision surgery as either a redo urethroplasty or perineal urethrostomy. And in terms of there were some, uh, there were a few complications that were encountered. Uh, these were the complications that we, we saw at between the first and second stages. It's also worth pointing out as well that uh, out of these patients, 56% uh, had uh, prior urethral surgery as well. So to conclude, uh, full-length strictures secondary to lichen sclerosis are complex. They do undergo quite a few additional procedures uh, other than the ones that they uh, initially had planned to have. Only 32% uh, within this group of patients uh, underwent both, both procedures as planned. Uh, and as it is a chronic and progressive condition, uh, we would advocate the use of uh, annual urethroscopy and careful clinical assessment in terms of uh, following these strictures up. So thank you very much. Any comments? This may not be a question you would want to answer because I note that this is a series uh, uh, now going back a considerable period of time. Um, and so Chris Chappell may prefer to answer on your behalf. Uh, our results with treating these patients has not been particularly brilliant either, much the same as yours. And much the same as yours until 2008, we used to treat them in this way. And I think the two things that we've learned in the last six years 
Uh, firstly, that uh, if somebody needs to have an operation, it's best to go for the Kulkarni type single stage uh, dorsal onlay, and that otherwise you struggle manfully to try and avoid operating at all. And so consequently, if our patients can pee, <coughs> or if they can pee as uh, supplemented with self-catheterization to hold it open to avoid having to operate on them, then we would do so. And that we would, <coughs> with an older patient who's perhaps not so keen, uh, tend to go for a perineal urethrostomy. Uh, I said I think Chris might want to answer that, but I notice he's doing quite a lot of nodding. Yes, Eva, I think we agree. I think that there's a lot of machoism in this field, but with these complex cases, you're right. I mean, they don't do particularly well, even when you try your best. Certainly, we use the Kulkarni wherever possible now, uh, particularly if the, the caliber has to be at least eight French, as I'm sure you'd agree, or around that. Um, and I agree that the problem with them is that you want... These are all patients who would refuse perineal urethrostomy for whatever reason, who weren't managing with intermittent self-dilation. So... It, they've really pushed us into doing this um, as, a, as a council of desperation, in a sense, from their point of view. Uh, but I think that with a combination of factors, we've, got a, we've turned people who are cripples into at least a 30% who did it, nothing further. And even the ones who had to self-catheterize, the, the, the stenosis is far shorter than it was before. So it, the quality of life is better. We weren't using a PROM at that stage. Your PROM that you developed, I think, is very useful in that context but I think that you'd find that they were much improved as compared to before we had used one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next we will move on to um, Stella Evas from the Institute of Urology talking to us about the management of sphincter weakness and continence in patients with a concomitant bladder neck contracture after the treatment of prostate cancer. Thank you. So I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of the reconstructive team at um, the Institute of Urology at UCLH. So post-prostatectomy incontinence and a blood and neck contracture commonly coexist after treatment for prostate cancer. And experience has taught us that the blood and neck contracture must be dealt with first before an artificial urinary sphincter is implanted to treat the incontinence. And this poster really um, shows our recent um, experience in, in this patient group. The diagnosis of blood and neck contracture was made either radiologically or endoscopically, and although not a cast iron rule, a contracture of stenosis um, was considered significant if a 16 French caliber catheter could not be passed. 69 of 157 consecutive patients with post-prostatectomy incontinence had a coexisting contracture diagnosed. All were treated endoscopically in the first instance, and 50 of them responded to a Mercedes-Benz type of blood and neck incision or blood and neck resection. In seven of these 50 patients, this was repeated if the contracture had recurred at three months. Um, otherwise, in 19 of the patients, the recurrent contracture was treated with an open revision um, of the vesicourethral anastomosis. A few patients performed self-dilatation to help stabilize the contracture, but only three had to continue with self-dilatation in the long term. Three months after satisfactory management of the blood and neck contraction, an artificial urinary sphincter was implanted around the bulbar urethra, generally with satisfactory results. So in short, blood and neck contractures that do not respond to one or two endoscopic manipulations should be treated by revision of the vesicourethral anastomosis, followed by implantation of an artificial urinary sphincter to restore urinary continence. Patients who have had radiotherapy have a less satisfactory final result because of radiation cystitis. And recently, we've tried to improve bladder function in these patients by use of a penile clamp to get the bladder working again and to simulate the effect that the artificial urinary sphincter might have were one to be implanted. And this is proving to be a very promising strategy. Can I invite any questions? <laughs> 
Any comments or questions about that? It's the first time I've heard of a penile clamp being used to treat a post-radiotherapy bladder. Any, any comments? Yeah, so um, essentially the problems uh, we had with these patients is that they have small capacity bladders and um, we'd put in a sphincter and they'd be up all night um, going five times a day. So this first gets their bladder cycling again and sometimes with the aim to improve the capacity and secondly if they can't tolerate it at night and they see that their frequency urgency is so bad then they probably accept that an artificial urinary sphincter might not be the optimal way to manage them. So um, yeah, we're, we've had a few patients um, even say they're very happy to continue with a penile clamp and didn't want the sphincter. So, yeah, we'll, um, we'll come back next year and, and report on that if we can. Um, another quick Thanks. question for you, yeah. um, Stella. The, uh, it always, I've only ever really seen it being done um, at, at a masterclass, um, but it looks tremendously challenging and difficult. Is there anything that you do differently in terms of operative technique for the patients that have had radiotherapy? when you're performing reconstruction? Um, or is the operation essentially the same? Because one would imagine they're even more challenging than the group who haven't had radiotherapy. So we're particularly careful to pre-assess them in terms, of their, um, in terms of their bladder capacity beforehand. And if this can be avoided, then, then that's best. Sometimes in the radiotherapy group, we, we do a dilatation um, and, and try to keep them continent with their contracture, but with them sort of self-dilating on a daily basis um, to a 16 French caliber and trying to compromise that way if we can avoid the big operation in this patient group. And quite clearly you don't do the bladder neck incision at six o'clock. I've seen two or three surgeons do that and end Certainly up with not, no. fairly disastrous results. Yeah, <laughs> no, we don't do that. <laughs> Smashing. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, could we have the next one up, which is 74? Uh, can filling phase urodynamic parameters predict the success of bulba artificial urinary sphincter in treating post prostatectomy incontinence? Good afternoon all. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, the reported success rate of the artificial urinary sphincter in literature in terms of treating uh, post-prostectomy incontinence ranges from about 50 to 70 percent. Uh, so the aim of our study was to assess whether filling phase urodynamic parameters can predict the success of uh, the AUS in treating this patient population group. Um, to do this, we reviewed the pre-AUS uh, urinamics of 99 patients. From the urinamics, we documented whether detrusive overactivity was demonstrated. If so, what the peak pressure was. Uh, we quantified uh, the mean capacity, uh, the detrusive overactivity peak pressure, and the compliance index three, which is uh, essentially the unit change in pressure per volume infused. We defined success as a patient reported continence or uh, the use of one safety pad. And uh, we did a series of fancy stats uh, to see whether uh, any of these factors were predictive. In terms of our results, 68% uh, of patients uh, had a successful outcome. Looking at the differences between the two groups, as you can see, uh, the mean compliance of the success group was significantly greater than the ones in the failure group, essentially demonstrating bladders that are four times more compliant, i.e. requiring four times as much fluid before we had the same equivalent change in pressure. Uh, looking at whether the truth over activity was demonstrated, as you can see, that the failure group had a much higher rate of patients with the truth over activity, 55%. And in the failure group, this was a much lower percent at 15%. And even when the truth over activity was demonstrated, it was typically much lower in the success group and much higher at a, a mean of 36 centimeter water in the failure group. And these differences in filling phase function were actually statistically significant. Uh, however, when we looked at the systematic capacity between the two groups, there was no difference. Uh, looking at the potential effect of radiotherapy, um, 18 patients had radiotherapy and 13 of them, or 72%, had uh, essentially a poor outcome. 
And in the success group, only nine out of the 68 that had a successful outcome had radiotherapy. So this is indicating potentially uh, the potential contributory factor of radiotherapy uh, to the outcome. So using this statistical difference in uh, filling phase essentially uh, function between the two groups and employing binary logistic regression, which is a fancy statistical technique, we are able to generate uh, what we call a normal gram to deduce uh, the probability of success uh, using an AUS. And uh, what it essentially has is on the x-axis, the compliance index C, uh, which is essentially the volume infused divided by the change in pressure against the peak detrusor pressure. And for these two parameters derived from the pre-AUS, you're able to counsel your patients to say whether they're likely to have a poor outcome, i.e. have persistent uh, incontinence or not. And if they land in the radial umbar region, it's saying there's a low probability of pure success just by uh, AUS treatment. And, and the ones that land in the green section probably having a higher probability of success uh, and ultimately being happier. So in conclusion, uh, compliance and detrusor overactivity, especially the peak pressure, are predictors of uh, uh, AUS success. And uh, what we've derived is essentially a normogram that allows you to use it as a counsel, uh, counseling tool uh, and essentially derive an individualized probability of success post-AUS implantation to treat post-prostatectomy incontinence. Thank you. to this penile clamp business. It's interesting that I started my career when penile clamps were about the only thing available for sphincter weakness. Now you can't even buy them anymore in the UK except online, uh, but they are coming to be rather useful because the problem with this, which is very interesting, very good, but an artificial sphincter corrects sphincter weakness incontinence. The reason why it doesn't work in this group of patients is nothing to do with the sphincter weakness incontinence, it's to do with the bladder. Okay. And the one useful thing that we learnt, as you've just heard Stella talking about with the bladder contracture group, is that you can actually simulate the result of an artificial sphincter by using a penile clamp for a few weeks before you do the operation. So rather than do a test and then flip a coin and look at a nomogram, you can actually give them an external urethral clamp to see whether an internal urethral clamp will be of value. And so interesting as this is, valuable as it is, true as it is, actually to test to see whether a sphincter is likely to be successful, accepting only, therefore, the risk of infection and implantation. To try patients with radiotherapy with a, a penile clamp before putting them forward to surgery is, I think, a very useful ploy. Uh, I agree, uh, and in fact, as part of our urinary assessment, especially in patients who demonstrate a grossly incompetent outlet, therefore we can't fill them, what we do is actually we mimic the function of uh, the artificial sphincter by clamping the urethra externally uh, using a neonate BP cuff and infusing, and uh, to some degree at least mimicking what uh, the, the likelihood of bladder function would be secondary to the AS. Obviously, using the peanut clamp allows you to do that for much longer, cycling the bladder, increasing the capacity, and perhaps that's the reason why uh, the systematic capacity is not a prognostic factor, because once you cycle the bladder, uh, uh, it shows that that might not be as uh, important a factor as once thought, because a lot short, of people short think... Short question, Chris. I think the peanut clamp's a very good idea, but don't forget the anatomical capacity under an anesthetic as well. So you've got a shrunken bladder, that's also a factor which leads to poor compliance, etc. Okay. That's okay. Right. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So next we have a presentation on the validation of patient reported outcome measures, PROMS, which is very uh, topical at the moment uh, for penile curvature surgery. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our work on this validation study uh, of a patient-reported outcome measure for penile curvature surgery. The objective measures of uh, successful penile curvature surgery uh, have been the 
straightness of the post-operative uh, erection, uh, but the subjective measures have been poorly defined. And our objectives were to validate a subjective measure, a tool that was sensitive enough to assess the complex interplay of uh, penile uh, curvature, uh, erectile dysfunction, and sexual relationships in patients diagnosed with Peyronie's disease or penile curvature. We had a rigorous uh, selection process uh, for our questions and our constructs. Um, we uh, conducted semi-structured interviews. We used a multidisciplinary RAND consensus group to uh, determine uh, the relevant constructs to be included. And uh, we refined a, a questionnaire down to a 22 item uh, questionnaire for use in this val validation study. We uh, applied the questionnaire to consecutive patients uh, who uh, were being considered for tunical plication surgery. 43 men uh, completed the questionnaire, self-completed in a test-retest fashion preoperatively. Um, we had really good response rates, over 85% for all our constructs. Uh, the novel constructs were the penile curvature constructs and the sexual relationship construct. Uh, the Penile curvature construct uh, demonstrated uh, good internal consistency with a Chromebax alpha above 0.7. Unfortunately, our sexual relationship construct did not uh, achieve that threshold. It withstood uh, analysis with a Bland Altman uh, plot uh, and also. Using a Wilcox and Sine rank test. Uh, there was no significant difference between the test and retest scores that we could establish, indicating that the bias was very small and that our uh, question construct was fairly robust. Uh, we faced a number of uh, challenges uh, in developing this questionnaire, mainly in its real-world application uh, and uh, sort of less stringent uh, exclusion criteria. We took uh, all comers, anyone who was willing to complete the questionnaire. That did pose some challenges. But in summary, we feel that our, our final questionnaire uh, includes the most robust items from this uh, validation study, um, despite the challenges that we face. Uh, in the future, to be able to completely validate this study, we will need to deploy the PROM across uh, a multi-center study, uh, which we're aiming to do in the next uh, six months, uh, to, to improve our turnaround of data uh, and hopefully uh, establish its generali generalizability uh, to this patient cohort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments from the floor? Okay, quick uh, question for you. Um, this is obviously very topical at the moment. I think it's definitely going to come in and we're going to end up doing this for more than just penile curvature surgery. We'll probably do it for lots of other things as well. Um, Traditionally, the sort of satisfaction rates that get reported, particularly with penile implants, are sort of 80, 90 percent ballpark figure. Do you think that this actually truly adds something new, or is it just confirming what we kind of thought in the in the first place? I guess it it it, it depends on your your what constitutes your overall outcome. If 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 you have a an objective outcome. Uh, that you can easily measure, that's one thing. But if there's a functional component to your surgery or to your repair, then, then patient reported outcomes are, are, are critical. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's why they're, they're helpful in, in surgery where there is a, a functional outcome to be considered. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Modified protocol using you. collagenase, clostridium, histolyticum, for the treatment of Peyronie's disease.
Uh, Zyopex is the first licensed treatment for uh, Peyronie's disease. The aim of this study was to uh, determine the safety and efficacy of Zyopex using a new modified shortened protocol. This is a prospective study where patients were assessed at baseline and after completion of treatment uh, by intracavernosal injection of Cavadrect, penile duplex, IIEF questionnaire and Peyronie's disease questionnaire. Exclusion criteria included complete plug calcification and ventral curvature. This treatment consisted of three injections separated by four weeks in combination with the vacuum pump therapy, uh, which is in contrast to the eight injections that were used in the clinical trials. The angle of curvature was measured objectively using a goniometer after intracavernosal injection of uh, cavadrect. The point of maximum curvature was marked. Zyopex was given in the flaccid state with the penis stretched under a penile block of plain lignocaine 1%. Zyopex is injected at the point of maximum curvature, which has been previously marked. The injection is given at a 90 degree through the plug, and as the needle is with, if slowly withdrawn, the, uh, the drug is injected. In between injections, patients use the combination of vacuum pump therapy, home modeling, and gentle stretching exercises in order to stretch the plug. So far, 28 patients completed treatment, all had three injections. Five patients requested three more injections to have a total of six injections. The mean penile curvature is base at baseline was 57 degrees. At at, after completing three injections, the mean curvature was 38.4 degrees. Of the 28 patients, 26 had improvements in curvature with a mean value of minus 18.56 degrees or minus 33% from baseline. The five patients who had three more injections continued to obtain additional curvature improvement. There were no systemic side effects, only mild local transient side effects uh, to the penis. And as we can see from this graph, most of the patients had curvature more than 45 degrees, and even men with severe curvature had significant reduction in the angle of the curvature, not just men with mild curvature. There were also improvements in all IIF questionnaire domains. In addition to improvements in the three Peyronie's disease questionnaire domains, the physical and psychological symptoms, the bother domain, and the pain uh, domain. The, Peronis, the global assessment of Peyronie's disease questionnaire is one question that asks the patient how they feel about their treatment. And as we can see from this uh, graph, most patients reported significant outcome. In conclusion, the new shortened protocol using Zyopex, three injections of Zyopex in combination with the vacuum pump, is safe, effective, and cost efficient. And thank you. Thanks, Amal. Um, just uh, about your treatment failures, how many were there? Because obviously your range went from zero. Yeah, so 28 40. completed the study, 26 had improvement, and only two had no improvement. Was that so, after three injections? You'd inject three times to find out they failed, or would, or would you just inject Yes, once? they completed three injections. So if someone has three injections and it, they, they obtain no response, then maybe Zyopex is not the, the best treatment for them. But we're only talking about two out of 28 patients. And can you comment why? Do you think it's technical or do you think it's a biological thing? Uh, I, think, I think it's a biological, really, related to the consistency and nature of the plug. I, I just have a bit of concern that 14, essentially, degrees <coughs> is, is, is an improvement that seems to make a difference clinically. And I don't quite buy that. Um, how long is follow-up? Which, which 14 and, degrees, and, sorry? And, and, if this fails, how many injections are you going to be giving? And you talk about cost effectiveness, but you haven't told us cost, actually. You've not mentioned cost at all. Uh, well, this protocol, the, the suggested protocol for Zyopex is eight injections, and this was the protocol used in the clinical trials. So we used a shortened protocol of three injections together with the vacuum pump, so it will be much cheaper. 
Yeah. Can you tell us how cheaper? I mean, what is the cost? The cost of a vial of Zyopex is six hundred and seventy pounds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this is six hundred and seventy by eight versus six hundred and seventy by three. Uh, the second question about uh, can I just talk about cost, Tim? David, go ahead. Yeah, I mean the cost is six fifty for a vial. If you buy in bulk, you're down to five hundred. Three vials can be split. Uh, two vials can be split to uh, two patients. Uh, to three patients, takes it down another third. So it's about uh, three hundred and seventy pounds per injection. Multiply by three plus the vacuum device. That comes in at about 1,200 quid, which is under the cost of a Nesbit operation. Um, I think we've got another question from the floor. Yeah, just a sort of technical point, really. You <coughs> say inject at the site of maximum curvature mm -hmm. um, in the plaque. Now, in the real world, the plaque isn't always at the site of maximum curvature. And the second point, a lot of patients have a gradual curve, not a actual angulation to their penis. So uh, were these all patients with bent penises with uh, plaques that you're injecting into, or was that a slight generalization? Uh, well, the plaque is not a point. The plaque is, is going to be like a, a, a block of scar tissue. We inject around the point of maximum curvature. So we will target the plaque around the area where we think that plaque is causing the maximum deformity. What I'm saying is a lot of patients have a sort of C-shaped bend. So where do you inject in those patients? The most, well, we mark the most concave, uh, so the most concave point, and we're going to inject that point two millimeters in front, two millimeters behind. So it is an area rather than uh, a point or, or one line. So we inject an area. So that would, be, that would include the gradual uh, curve that you're describing. But that can be over the whole dorsal shaft? No, not really, no. Okay, well, I mean, a lot of patients do just have a curve, not an angle. I just, just want to know in reality, that's the reality of what, what, is, what we see in clinics. They're not all just bent in one place. So, and they often biplanar curves. So I just want to know how you really do it, not just how No, it's, you... a, it's exactly what I've described. So okay. it is the, the, we will mark the most concave area and we will inject two millimeters in front and two millimeters behind. So we're injecting a four millimeter area around where we think the penis is most bent. In reality, it's like when you're doing an esbit, and this is where you're going to put the Alice forceps and do your ellipse. So it is exactly, but instead of doing the surgical plication, we're doing a chemical, uh, sort of chemical knife, if we can call it. So it's exactly the same point that you would do your Nesbit at. It's clearly sparked a lot of discussion. Uh, I think we'll take one last question, Duncan, if that's just, all right. Just a quick one. Have you tried it without a vacuum device? Because, you know, there are some papers in the literature show a vacuum device alone has a, a potential in improving the curvature. Yes, we, we did that paper, actually. So in, uh, <laughs> so we are, we are combining Xyopex with vacuum to maximize the response. Can I just you, there's a snapshot. That, I mean, there's a clinical trial just finished, exactly the same as the Impress, uh, but this time using the vacuum device. So with the impress, it was 18 degrees. With the vacuum device, it's 25 degrees. Just to reply to your, your point you made about the cost, David, we know what we get with an S, but we don't know what we get with this. Well, when, yeah. you know. OK. Smashing, thank you very much. Thank you. So next we have uh, another presentation from the Institute of Urology on high-flow priapism, uh, association with high-risk ED and corporal fibrosis. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's um, Aya Kalajai, and I'll be presenting our findings on a series of 23 patients who presented to our um, centre with um, non ischemic. Uh, priapism. Non-ischemic priapism is a relatively rare condition, even within the priapism fam group of fa um, syndromes. It's usually, um, it usually follows penile or perineal trauma, resulting in a painless, persistent erection. 
currently the EAU and the AUA um, recommend that this does not require um, treatment as an emergency and can be managed either conservatively or with angioembolisation. The aims of our study was to look at the real-life outcomes in these patients um, over, over a period of time in regards to their erectile dysfunction, what happens to them, um, and how they're managed. So we looked at um, 23, we, found, we identified 23 patients between 2008 and 2016. Diagnosis was based on both clinical and radiological, radiological assessment. Three of, three of the 23 patients were managed conservatively with the rest undergoing angioembolization. And the outcome measures we studied were, were resolution of their priapism, erectile dysfunction, and the number of embolization treatments they required. As expected, the majority of patients, um, their high flow priapism was secondary to trauma. Um, out of the three patients who were managed conservatively, two of them spontaneously resolved. Out of the 20 patients managed with angioembolization, 17 of those um, were sex successfully treated um, at last follow-up. When we look, looked at how many treatments they required, um, 15 patients required one or two embolization sessions, with 11 of those patients um, only requiring one treatment. We also looked at erectile dysfunction, or we didn't have the SHIM score, unfortunately. Um, so what we did was we looked at how many patients reported a problem with their erections requiring erectogenic um, agents. And we had data on 19 of the 23 patients, and all of, the, all of them reported um, a diminishment in the quality of their erections and the requirement of erectogenic agents. Um, as part of their follow-up, we also looked at um, how many patients had had MRI scans, and we found eight patients had had MRI scans to, um, as part of the management of their um, severe erectile dysfunction, all due to failure to respond to erectogenic agents. All of those patients had corporal fibrosis on their MR scans. A further two patients had corporal fibrosis reported on an, on an ultrasound scan. And this group of patients with corporal fibrosis actually included two patients who had been managed conservatively. I'll just summarize very quickly. So we would recommend that um, angioembolization is highly effective in this group of patients. But further to that, um, these patients really need to be counseled about um, the risk erectile dysfunction, whether you treat them conservatively or treat them with angioembolization. We don't really know why they're getting corporal fibrosis and we don't really know how to quantify which patients or how many of them will get corporal fibrosis and future erectile dysfunction. Um, so we would recommend that they ought to be treated early with angioembolization and um, would institute early PDE5 inhibitors in these patients. Thank you very much. Is, is you haven't defined what the initial insult was. So the initial trauma might have caused an AB fistula, for example, but it might have also caused corporal fibrosis. The word go, and it's not necessarily the angioembolization that's caused fibrosis. Well, we don't think the angioembolization has caused the, the fibrosis because we know that in, the, in two of our patients were managed conservatively, they already had corporal fibrosis. Now, when they come to us, they come to us from around the, around the country. We re-scan them. Um, with um, our dedicated radiologist. So he's looking for corporal fibrosis and he will sometimes mm. tell us early. Um, and in at least one of the patients who were managed conservatively, they already had corporal fibrosis 19 days mm. post injury. And we don't think that's necessarily related to their initial injury. Um, Any other comments? Yep, we'll in the interest on. of time, we'll move on. That's great, thank you. Okay. I'm going to stay, if that's okay. You're going to stay, right? I'm yeah. going to stay. Please do. So, um, I think that's the next one. Yeah, that's yeah. So, so penile prosthesis, implantation after female to male uh, total phallic reconstruction. An impressive series of 247. Yes, I, I'm, my colleague sends his apologies, so I'll be presenting on his behalf. Um, 
penile, I'm going to present our findings from penile prosthesis implantation following um, female to male um, phallic reconstruction. Um, this tends to be the last stage of these patients' um, surgery, and it allows them to have both phallic turgidity as well as engage in sexual intercourse, which is usually very important for these patients. Um, we identified 247 patients between 2001 and 2015. Um, approximately 63% of them had had um, a single cylinder implantation, with the rest having two cylinder implantations. All of these patients had a Dacron cap and sock um, attached to both the proximal and the distal end of the cylinders, and this allows um, both anchoring of the um, cylinders um, and also allow, um, prevents um, erosion, as you know, these patients don't have a corpora. That's just a picture of a, a final result. So just over 50% over of these patients had their original implant still in situ at last follow-up. However, 8.5% of them had had the implant removed for acute infection, and 15.4% had the implant revised due to mechanical failure. Now, when we looked at um, the causes of mechanical failure, um, the most common causes were um, cylinder rupture, cylinder aneurysm and tubing rupture in 69, 19 percent and 12.1%. 12, 12 we also looked at whether there are any predictors for which of these patients will, get, will need revision surgery. And we couldn't really identify any particular risk factors um, in, which, in terms of which patients will need um, revision. So uh, in terms of survival of the implant, the five-year survival rate was 78% and the 10-year survival rate was about 58%. So in conclusion, these patients, this is a good operation for these patients, but it does have a complication rate and we need to counsel these patients going into the surgery about these results, but also we need to have a good understanding about both what complications they're likely to have and what the causes of those complications will be. Thank you very much. That's a very impressive series given the, uh, the type of uh, patient you're putting the prosthesis in. David, what, what, do you use these figures now to counsel your patients? You have a very famous case that I know about that uh, wanted to know what the percentage was. Yeah, um, yeah, we do this. I mean, the take home is that the implants don't last as long. Um, and I think you've got to be honest with the patients that you know probably not going to last 10 years. They're a younger group of patients. Penis is not quite the same. Um, but also a third of the patients never use it. So that is an issue. Do you, do you think just putting them uh, in, in, in an envelope of uh, um, artificial material uh, affects the mechanical wear and tear? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you get wear and tear between the dacron of the vascular prosthesis and the cylinders. Uh, that's an issue and of course inf increased infection risk because of additional prosthetics material. So do you, do you think you should be going to the companies and say we need a different type of... Uh, both impact? companies are now looking into, because there's a huge surge in the numbers of patients, yeah. uh, surprise, surprise, both companies are now interested in making a transsexual penile implant. In fact, there is one from Zephyr already on the market. Well, we look forward to hearing about it in a few years' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, yeah. so the next uh, presentation is on the significance of close surgical margins in organ sparing surgery for penile SCC. So good morning. My name is Dan Shansri. I'm a uh, ST3 at St George's Hospital, and I'm here to present our work on the significance of close surgical margins uh, in p organ sparing surgery for penile cancer. So historically, a two-centimeter margin has been uh, considered important uh, in penile cancer surgery. However, over the last decade or so, uh, work done particularly by UCL has uh, challenged that. Um, organ sparing surgery is becoming more common, um, and the traditional view of a two-centimeter margin is being challenged. In our practice, we come across two cohorts of patients that uh, we feel provide treatment challenges, and one of those are those with close surgical margins. So this study um, looks into those that have close but clear margins. 
in terms of what we've done, it's a prospective uh, analysis uh, and a collection of data over an 11-year period from 2001. Uh, we've excluded patients with positive margins and those treated uh, with non-curative intent or palliative intent. And we've looked at them uh, with local recurrence falling into two categories. We've defined ACET as em embolic uh, spread, so this is tumor at a distant site spread through the lymphovascular route, um, and residual disease, which is disease still at the site of resection. This is an example of how our uh, specimens are presented to allow for accurate and reliable interpretation by our dedicated group of pathologists uh, when it comes to uh, analyzing closed margins. So an overview of our data, 332 patients were eligible for our study uh, with a mean age of 63.5. Uh, glanzectomies accounted for the vast majority of our procedures over this time frame. Um, and as you can see, looking at the grading and the staging data, we, a significant proportion of our patients were high-risk disease. If we look at our margins themselves, the vast majority, 64%, fell at five millimeters or less, uh, with 16% of patients having a clear margin of less than a millimeter. So how did we do? 15 patients, um, which is 4%, uh, had a local recurrence with a median time to recurrence of six months. And this is comparable uh, with other studies. It was a relatively even split between mechanism of recurrence between embolic uh, and disease at the site, previous site of uh, resection. We found a, a statistically significant uh, uh, relationship between cavernosal involvement and local recurrence. However, we did not find uh, a significant relationship between having a clear margin that was less than five millimeters compared with one that was more than five millimeters with recurrence. So what did we learn? We've learned that recurrence due to residual disease in organ sparing surgery is low, 2%. Embolic spread is as likely to occur. And we've found that a deep clear margin of more than a millimeter is sufficient in the absence of cavernosal involvement and lymphovascular invasion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from the floor? We've got a couple. Um, and it should be commended on it, actually, it's the largest series, and I think that this is the study that we need really to confirm and validate our previous findings. Um, just two points. Firstly, did you, do you routinely use frozen section? Um, and if not, again, it's a good point because we commonly used to use frozen section when I was doing it. Um, the second point relates to a multivariate analysis in terms of lymph node involvement as well and distant spread. So did you look at that? So presumably the ones with lymphovascular invasion would have a higher risk of spread or higher stage disease. So was that an influencing factor really? So for example, if you had patients with positive nodes, would you do a more extensive resection anyway, localized excision? And, for, and the first question of course is frozen section. So um, with, in answer to the first question, we don't use frozen section routinely um, uh, in, in our cases. Um, and in answer to the second question, um, the purpose of the study was to look purely at local recurrence uh, and margin status. Um, there's already been work looking at lymphovascular invasion, and, and the paper released by, by our group also looked at nodal status in terms of recurrence. Um, and so that's largely well, known. Um, and the, po the, the focus of the study was to look purely at margin status, particularly those with close margins, and what, what, how do we manage this sort of challenging group of patients in terms of should they be under closer observation, should they be reoperated. So the, the focus was on that particular aspect uh, of organ sparing surgery. Uh, just a little way from, from what you presented here, which I think is excellent, but uh, you know, how do, what's our definition of a positive margin? And I, I think, Nick, you presented some work a few years ago. You know, how are we treating those patients differently? Do, do you think we need to go back and regularly re-resect some of the guidelines, say they should have radiotherapy? I'm not quite sure what to do with them, really. Well, that was a abstract that was rejected, actually, by BAUS this year. So I can tell you the data. We've got 43 patients with truly positive deep resection margins who were evenly split between those we observed based on perhaps our belief that they were lower-grade tumors or it was a small focus, all, do all done through the MDT, but pretty much even split between the obser observation and reoperation. The observation group, I think, if I recall, we have two recurrences. 
and in the group that we re-operated on, the ones we thought were at higher risk of real residual disease, there were only six that had actually got residual disease in the specimen. So overall, the positive margins had about 15% of the positive margin group had residual disease when you either watched them or operated on them. So it's still not very common. Yeah, just to come back, you know, I think that's what we, we're seeing um, up in our centre as well. And it's a shame that these guys are going back and having partial penectomies for a positive margin. I think it's a real problem. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next paper is on uh, whether we do video endoscopic radical inguinal lymph node dissection or open for penile cancer patients. Uh, Kumar from Norfolk and Norwich. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm presenting my experience on uh, video endoscoping one lymph node dissection compared to opening one lymph node dissection. I'm just presenting some more updated data than what is in the abstract, actually. So we all we all know that inguinal lymph node metastasis and its treatment is uh, the cornerstone in management of uh, penile cancer, but open lymphadenectomy has got high morbidity. There has been controversy what is the percentage of complication, and if you look at the data, it varies from 15 to 70 percent, but still it's a very highly morbid operation. So we, tried, we introduced video endoscopic procedure as an alternative for open procedure to reduce the complication rate. So, uh, we are one of the 10 uh, supranetwork centers and we cater for the east of England. From, we collect all the inguinal lymphadectomy data from 2008 prospectively. In 2010, we introduced dynamic central node biopsy as a diagnostic technique. And in 2013, we introduced the video endoscopic procedure. The results, I've got uh, data on 68 groin node dissections. 35 of them were open and 33 of them were endoscopic. It was in 42 patients. So the age, uh, stage, and grade of the tumor did not differ between the groups. With respect to the length of stay, it reduced from a mean of 7.3 days in open group to 2.5 days in the endoscopic group, and it was statistically significant. Looking at the operative time, there was no difference in mean operative time statistically, statistically significant. But in general, in my experience, I find that it is probably 10 to 15 minutes. It takes a bit more longer. We looked at the lymph node. Uh, we looked at the lymph node status in, and its involvement as a surrogate for the cancer, cancer outcome. And if you look at it, there is actually significantly more number of lymph nodes retrieved in the video endoscopic group. And the mean number of positive lymph nodes were also higher. The mean lymph node density was slightly higher, but it was not statistically significant. More importantly, we had a 71 months mean follow-up in open group and 16 months mean follow-up in endoscopic group, and there were no recurrence in both the groups. We compared the uh, complications. 24 out of the 35 groins had wound-related complications, which amounts to 68%, whereas only two groins had complication in window endoscopic group, which accounts for 6%. So both was uh, statistically significant. And we classified it according to the Clavi and Dindo, and it was quite significant for anything about uh, 3A or 3B. So just I put a couple of pictures of the procedure. We use a three-port technique, and also this is just immediate post-op period for the, one of the patients who had bilateral inguinal and pelvic lymph node, along with the spinectomy, which took six hours. In conclusion, we find that video endoscopic procedure is safe, carries low morbidity, and we feel that we have had enough follow-up that it should be a treatment of choice for most, if not all, the patients. Thank you. Where did you go and learn your technique? I think there is no other center in the UK that is doing it. So actually, it's a combination. I've been doing open for the last uh, eight years or so. 
and I was doing pelvic lymphadenectomy for prostate and bladder cancer. It's a combination of both. It was a struggle to actually get an ethics approval from a, a clever local hospital, but I managed to convince them. It's a great technique, and, and obviously the, the way you do it is, is very clever. But I just, the, the, when you say comparison with open surgery, are you saying all types of incision for inguinal surgery or for certain types that you perform? Because a lot of open surgical incisions actually heal very quickly, and your main complications were the wound-related complications. So do you have a comment on what kind of incision you use for your... Uh, wound, for example, versus other types of operation which do probably have a low rate of complication in terms of healing. Yeah, I think it's a very valid point. Actually, you know, we are writing the paper and we are uh, getting some comments. Actually, two of us did opening one lymphadenectomy, so me and Krishna, and actually we have a different form of incision. And in fact, we don't find that much difference in actually the complication between the two groups. And in my personal opinion, it is actually, it's not the it, uh, the incision shape, etc., contributes to it, but if you are careful, still the seroma accumulation and opening of the wound, which makes them to stay longer. So it's not the type of incision. It does contribute, but I think the seroma accumulation and opening of the wound, which contributes more to it. That's my that personal feeling. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll move on if... Um I think I'm right here that we've already had 11 and 12, so we'll move on to presentation uh, 13. Do alcohol smoking and male age affect semen parameters in IVF and ICSI outcome? My name is Khaled Al Mikati, and I'm presenting this on behalf of the andrology team in UCH. Um, the aim of this study was to detect the effects of alcohol and smoking and the male age on the sperm parameters, as well as the outcomes of the IVF and ICSI. Um, regarding the methodology, um, we have reviewed um, uh, the records of more than 1,200 patients attending uh, the same IVF uh, clinic retrospectively from January 2013 to December 2014. And uh, we tried to investigate the relation between uh, the alcohol consumption, smoking, and the male uh, age with the, um, the parameters, the parameters and the outcome of the IVF and ICSI. Um, the age, the number of cigarettes smoked per day, and the number of units of alcohol consumed per week were recorded along with the parameters of the sperm analysis and the outcome of the IVF and ICSI. Um, the females over 37 years were excluded. Also, the smoking and the alcohol consumption were categorized into mild, moderate, and high consumption. And finally, multivariate analysis was done to detect the effect of these factors um, in regards with the, the sperm parameters and the outcome of the IVF and ICSI. Regarding the results, um, we have reviewed the records of 1,257 couples attending the same fertility unit. Uh, the mean female age was about 34 years. 13% of the males were smoker. About 77% of the males had a history of alcohol consumption. Um, also, uh, about 36% of the couples underwent IVF, while 57% underwent ICSI, and about 7% failed uh, in terms of embryo development. Um, regarding the results, we have found out that the increasing male age decreased all the sperm parameters. Um, smoking decreased mainly the sperm motility, and doesn't affect the other parameters, but alcohol affects the, the sperm uh, motility and the sperm morphology and also doesn't affect the other parameters. So we come to the conclusion. To conclude, the advancing male age and uh, smoking and alcohol impair sperm parameters. Uh, however, the number of cigarettes and the amount of alcohol consumed didn't correlate with the IVF and the ICSI outcome. 
uh, the live birth rate from the IVF or EXE are not affected at all by these factors, suggesting that the technologies uh, improve the fertility outcomes possibly by optimizing the sperm selection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, should we not be telling our patients to stop smoking, reduce their alcohol consumption now, because it doesn't, doesn't matter? Yes. Um, in spite of that, the, the outcome of the IVF and eggs is not affected, but all the parameters of the sperm analysis are affected by smoking and alcohol consumption. So, theoretically speaking, um, avoiding or decreasing smoking and alcohol consumption will improve the sperm parameters. Consequently, the chances of the normal pregnancy and also, I think, the, the outcome of the IVF. And so you think it's actually more technology and operator and center related as opposed to? Yes, but the, the point is that this may improve also the chances for the normal pregnancy, uh, not, on, not only the, the outcome of the IVF and ICSI, but also the normal pregnancy chances. Okay, fantastic. Any other comments or questions from the floor? No, we'll move swiftly on. Thank you. So, um, live birth rates in men with non-obstructive azeospermia undergoing micro-dissection testicular sperm extraction. Oops. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is a study that we've done um, our institution and essentially we're looking at the actual live birth rates of people that are presented to us with non-obstructive azospermia. All the studies, most of the studies in fact only report on sperm retrieval rates but that's obviously not the end point so we wanted to look into that. Now, um, we collected retrospectively um, for quite a long period of time, um, reporting on the first uh, cycle of ICSI. The primary measures were pregnancy rates, live birth rates. Uh, we've done a multivariate analysis, and we took into consider uh, the age, Johnson score, and histological analysis, uh, diagnosis, sorry. So uh, the results, we got 230 patients. The median age for the female patients was um, uh, for the male patients were 41 and the female was 35. Um, sperm retrieval was achieved in 46% of patients and of those, 83 went on to have ICSI cycles. Um, there were two embryos implanted. Um, the pregnancy rate was about 60% and the live birth rate was about 12.2%. Um, further second cycle uh, of ICSIs were done and the accumulated birth rate over that was 32%. There was no significant difference in pregnancy or live birth rates uh, between fresh and frozen sperm. And also the um, number of successful embryo implants were associated with successful live uh, birth rates in the multivariate analysis. Another little point that we need to make is that in four patients on the day with cryopreserved cryo sperm was not good enough. Um, so maybe we should make a note in some patients that they might need to have donor sperm on standby. So finally, the sperm can be retrieved in 46% of all men with uh, um, non-obstructive azoospermia, which is more or less the same in the literature. Um, overall, 12.2% will go on to achieve paternity. Uh, so it's important that when the patients come in to our clinic with non-obstructive azoospermia, maybe that's the most important point that we make. Yes, we can find sperm in 46% of you, but 12% will go home with a baby. Thank you. Okay, nice study. Any questions, thoughts? It sucks. <laughs> I know you are. I think that one of the things that always struck me, the reason why I was concerned about the the success rates was everybody re reports basically on success rate in terms of sperm acquisition. So I think that you've got to remember the data that we're presenting here is for the first, so if you get 100 patients who are coming to you, you can say to them that basically you've got a 16% chance. 
that you're going to get a live birth rate um, when they first come to clinic. And I think that's more realistic mm -hmm. um, figure to these patients. And of course, the cumulative success rates, which you didn't really allude to, Chris, uh, mm -hmm. are higher than that. But that's after one to five cycles, and that can go up to about 60 odd percent. But I think the key is, or the message is, is that they are low in terms of live birth rates um, if you're a first come patient uh, in terms of non-obstructive azospermia. And I think that's really the, the key point, rather than just relying on mm -hmm. sperm retrieval rates, which can, of course, be um, misleading. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, it's about 30 to 35 percent success rate in ejaculated sperm, just to put that into perspective, so it's much lower. Yes, please do, yeah. So some of these couples are very persistent in, in, well, they're all very persistent in their desire for a pregnancy. And our, our referring IVF unit locally is starting to ask for repeat micro procedures. And, I, and I'm, I'm not particularly convinced of the benefit of, I'm, I'm told that there is some evidence, scanty evidence. I wondered what your Yeah, the, the evidence is in scant, yeah, absolutely. There's not enough evidence for that. Uh, we usually wait about... No, hang on. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> there is evidence. Okay. Well, so there's, there's, so in fact, I've written a paper on microtesi. Okay. Redo microdissection sperm retrieval. So that paper was in the context of patients who've had TESA or conventional TZ. Mm -hmm. And we found sperm in about 50% of patients. Okay. So that study is BJUI yeah. from 2014. In the context of microtesi that has failed, or patients who've had a microtesi and they've failed an ICSI cycle when they found sperm, there is evidence in the Japanese literature that if you re-stimulate these patients and you get sperm retrieval rates about 20%, giving them HCG and giving them Clomid. So there are a number of studies, but again, it's something that we need to do a trial on. It's mm -hmm. something collaboratively, which is the message that we're trying to get across about male fertility managed by urologists, because clearly you don't want your testicles operated on by a gynecologist. Thank you. And we'll move on now to our last presentation on human somatogonial stem cell culture and cryopreservation from Newcastle. Hi everyone, my name is Ravine Sander, I'm one of the ST4s in Newcastle. Today I'm just going to speak to you about human SSC culture and cryopreservation. Um, about 900 boys are diagnosed with childhood cancer annually in the UK. Um, mainstay of treatment tends to be chemo radiation. This can lead, is gonadotoxic and can lead to SSC depletion um, and ultimately impairing fertility when this child hits adulthood. Um, as it stands, prepubescent boys don't have a method of preserving their fertility. Um, uh, research done previously has shown that if you do an SSC transplantation into a sterile host, a murine host, you can restore spermatogenesis. So from that study, lots of research has then been looking at SSCs as a potential cellular therapy of the future. Um, there are quite a few hurdles with bringing this, translating this um, to the clinical setting. Um, namely, culturing these cells is really difficult. Uh, they're slow to proliferate, and viability tends to be poor after cryopreservation. So the aims of my study was to try and work out a rapid, reliable, and reproducible method of culturing these cells, and also a way of storing them effectively. So I used... Um, uh, mouse tissue from day six mice, uh, which are around the prepubertal age, and also um, testicular tissue from men undergoing surgical sperm retrieval to do my experiments. Uh, okay, so. So, what I found is that um, in all, by using a somatic cell. A testicular somatic cell feeder layer, I was able to accelerate um, colon SSC colony formation when compared to some of the described protocols in the literature. In addition, when I, that was in the mouse, and I then moved on to the human tissue, and I managed to mimic those results. I stained these, and uh, they continued to express markers for undifferentiated spermatogonial stem cells. Um, so that was my mouse-to-human work. 
I then wanted to work out how can I freeze these cells because previous studies have shown really poor cryopreservation um, uh, uh, survival rates. So I used vitrification because that's something that they were using at the centre I was working at in cryopreserving human embryos for clinical IVF. Vitrification is just really rapid cooling which then skips the ice crystal uh, formation steps so the cell membrane tends, tends to stay intact a bit better. Um, I did that with mouse and human SSC colonies. They're about the same size as an embryo, actually, about 200 microns. Um, and what I found was that tunnel staining, staining which is um, the marker of uh, DNA damage, was low. KI67 proliferative marker was good. So both in the human and in the mouse colonies, um, I, I got a good cell viability rate after warming. Um, so, in summary, co-culture with testicular somatic cells accelerated SSC proliferation and their maintenance in culture, and um, vitrification seems to be uh, a, a good way of cryopreserving these cells effectively, and it doesn't seem to impact on cell expansion afterwards. So I think altogether it's quite a nice step towards possibly bringing this uh, uh, strategy uh, to clinics of the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Excellent. That brings our session to an end. Thank you to all the speakers and all of you who've um, come along to the session. Um, we'll just have a look at the scores and then announce. Okay, so we've, been, we've, we've scored all the presentations and we jointly agree uh, um, that the paper that uh, scored highest was the significance of closed surgical margins in organ sparing surgery for penile squamous cell cancer from St George's. So that's the one we'll get the best e-poster winner. I just want to come up, we'll get, we'll get Tim to um, write it out and sign it and present it to you. Don't know if anybody wants to take a quick photo of you as you come up. But. So, okay.